This is a production of PBS Charlotte. Next on a special Carolina impact, protesters looking for change. I will never stop marching. I will Police never stop looking for cooperation. This is not an us against them. Families looking out for their kids. The talk is a vital, it is part of a rite of passage. And social media looking at everything. But let me tell you something right here. We're a community looking for answers. Carolina Impact's special Seeking Unity starts now. Good evening. Thanks so much for joining us for this special report. I'm Amy Burkett. What we saw this summer and what we're feeling now across our region is a community divided, often divided over what's to blame for racism. It was reignited a thousand miles away when George Floyd died in police custody, and police everywhere became the focus of that controversy. But here in our area, it's a controversy we've seen before. Tonight, Carolina Impact's Jeff Sawyer takes us inside the police protests, then and now. No peace. No peace. No peace. No peace. No peace. Then why are we dying in the streets? Why are we dying in the streets? We can't stand for it anymore. It's that question that brings thousands of these police protesters marching in the streets, past police headquarters, angry about what they call their mistreatment by the police. If they're not going to treat you like citizens, if they're going to brutalize you and abuse you and beat you and treat you like you're an escaped slave, if they're going to continue to do that, then we have the power. Don't shoot. Don't shoot. But Charlotte's new police chief has a question of his own for the protest. Why aren't we seeing that passion when, when I have a 14-year-old that's killed on the streets? You have to have the passion for both. Black lives matter. And yes, all lives matter, but they can't all lives matter until black lives matter. Yeah. So don't try to shut me up with your statistics. Don't tell me about Chicago. Don't tell me about murder rates. I'm here. I live in North Charlotte. I know what Charlotte is. You can't tell me that, that we are the problem. No racist police! No racist police! And I tell our officers for uh, everyone that you hear that criticizes or hates you as in, or hates your profession, uh, there's a hundred or thousand more people out there that, that respect what you do and love what you do. Uh, and so we have to be careful of what voices we're listening to. Chief That's Johnny Jennings was deputy uh, chief back in May and June when those voices of protest came to the government center, calling for him and former chief Kerr Putney to step down. If we are allowing the chief to allow officers on the street to do what they will and for him not to have any knowledge of it, he don't need to be there in the first place. Jennings also heard the protest voices in 2016. When the entire country was focused on a fatal police shooting here in Charlotte. Our police. Our protesters. Our problems. All center state. Four years later, these Charlotte police protests are part of a larger nationwide movement. Not starting here, not ending here, but certainly taking hold here. These are sustained protests, night after night, also day after day. And uh, they're not just in Uptown either, they're also spreading out into some of Charlotte's oh, neighborhoods. Neighborhoods where police push to repair the damage from four years ago between the cops and their critics. Do you feel like after this year, you're kind of back at square one, you don't get credit for all the things you did do? Yes. since 2016? Yeah, I, I think there is some of that. Chief Jennings says a lot has changed since 2016, including these Charlotte Citizen workshops. So, as soon as you see his hand raised, you fire. Explaining to the public when they use deadly force and when they don't. But then came the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis. 
that was murder. It is what it is. And so we felt just as sick about it as the public did. Uh, and what's unfortunate is that much of the public didn't see that. It's not fair, but it is reality. It's the reality you have to deal with as police chief. Absolutely. It's, 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 you're right. It's not fair. It's reality, but it's also a reality that one incident can bring us 10 steps back. So we, we are back at square one. Hey, wave goodbye. They're all about to get gas. Here in Charlotte, that one incident may have been the police use of tear gas. on the protesters up top. Down the hill! That's what triggered this huge demonstration outside the government center and their demands. To defund the military tactics, the, the tear gas, the pepper spray, then we need to come back with a thousand more and a thousand more the day after that and a thousand more the day after that until we get rid of the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department. Versus Chief Jennings defending the police but also proactively changing department tear gas policy and disciplining officers for violating those policies. We're going to make mistakes because we're human beings just like everyone else. And uh, uh, we'll make our mistakes, but the, the question is, what do we do after we make those mistakes? Do we get better and learn from that? And our agency has always tried to strive for that. This is not an us against them. Uh, this is how we can be better, and this is how we can uh, uh, win the trust of the community and we have to show the people that that we are in it for the safety and uh, well-being of our community. I will never stop marching. I will never stop screaming to the top of my lungs that yes, black lives matter. We do have to get rid of that stigma of, uh, of, of racism within the agency, and, and the only way to do that is to prove it and prove it through our actions. Some of the same officers that were injured during the riots that were getting rocks and um, frozen water bottles and fireworks blown up in their face. Some of those same officers are the same ones that are out in the communities doing great work. And I've said all along, until we come to the table uh, and, and have those tough discussions and, and meet together, uh, then we're not going to get anywhere. If we're going to butt heads, we're going to spin our wheels in the dirt, and it's going to be a stalemate. So we have to be able to extend that olive, olive branch and, and come together as, as a, an agency and as a community to make things better. Thank you so much, Jeff. On our website, pbscharlotte.org, you'll find a link to all the officer body cam videos released by Charlotte Mecklenburg Police from the protests. Not just the clips you've seen on the news, but the entire videos. So you can see what the police saw and hear how the police reacted for yourself. Well, as racial unrest and the call for justice takes center stage, social media plays a powerful role in what we see and when we see it. As Carolina Impact's Todd Wallace tells us, social media is the reason images from Charlotte streets traveled around the world. Whether a fire, shooting, accident, or scandal, not too long ago we had to wait until evening to watch what happened or be patient until morning to read about it. Those days are gone. It's not an overstatement to say technology led by smartphones and social media has taken over how and even when we consume our news. We're in a time of where real time means a lot, right? So people want it right now in a moment. Gantt Center President and CEO David Taylor is of course very aware of technology and how it can shape and move society. The museum has even featured discussions on the recent social unrest that's also been captured by phones and shared immediately on social media. Well, social media has played a huge role. It's created real-time communication uh, that people can, get, people can get involved. It's also allowed people to be able to express themselves. Kids of all ages know exactly what happens when you toss a pebble into a pond. One small splash creates a ripple effect that can spread several feet. It's the same principle with a phone. This small device has the capability of impacting millions when it captures something compelling or even disturbing, except that ripple effect can turn into a wave of momentum and emotion simply by pressing post, send, 
or share. But let me tell you something right here. This 16, he's 16. He's 16. What we gonna do? You tell me what we gonna do. This ain't the way. The power of social media became a personal reality for 32-year-old Charlotte resident and activist Curtis Hayes Jr. That's him in May, standing between two other generations of black males, one 16, the other 45, as Curtis pleaded that they not let anger become rage. They were all protesting what happened during those eight minutes and 46 seconds in Minneapolis. A bystander recorded their impassioned and painful exchange and it's now been seen on social media more than 20 million times. If we didn't have social media, we would be in the blunt. Everything that is coming to the light wouldn't be, wouldn't be shown. It connects people from all across the globe, all perspectives, conversation everywhere. Social media is the tool that catapulted Curtis to a global stage. He's been interviewed on Good Morning America and TV shows from Europe to Australia. The words that was spoke was real, the tears and the moment in itself was just real. Sir. Right now, it's gonna happen 10 years from now. And right. in 26, you're gonna be doing the same thing I'm doing. You understand me? When you capture those moments of just rawness and it spreads through the world, people are able to relate to that because it's raw, it's real, it's not scripted. 10 years. You're gonna be right here too. But he also got to So what I need what to do right up. now at 16 is come up with a better way. Cause how we doing it, it ain't working. We show the viral video to people at Freedom Park to get their reaction about social media's ability to capture a moment that can turn into a movement. I know kind of just on my Instagram feed, I know a lot of kind of activists have been using it as a way to share information um, and kind of just using it to disseminate kind of what's happening. Well, I think that the power of really understanding what other people are going through is something that's really helpful to be able to see as well. In 2018, the Pew Research Center found that social media has become the main source of news online with more than 2.4 billion internet users. Almost two thirds receive breaking news from Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, and other social media sites instead of traditional media. A smartphone and social media platform means anyone can be a citizen journalist and share everything they choose. However, photojournalist Nancy Pierce cautions that's not always a good thing. Social media is a mixed blessing. We can spread the word faster, we can gather a demonstration together faster, but on the other hand, it lacks context. And Ashley Weather says access to more information was more than she could handle. She's no longer on Facebook. Go, too much going on. The same stuff every day. Yep. The same stuff every day. Was it having an effect on you? No, I'm just tired of seeing it. But Curtis Hayes Jr. says he's thankful social media gives anyone a chance to see injustice. Ready. This committed father hopes his elevated social media platform will help him connect communities of different colors. 10, 15 years from now, I hope everybody understands that we should all love on someone that we were taught to hate. We should all speak to someone that we were taught not to speak to. And you don't need social media to do that. For Carolina Impact, I'm Todd Wallace reporting. Thank you, Todd. A study from the Pew Research Center shows a vast majority of Americans, 96% own a cell phone, and 81% of those folks own a smartphone. That compares back to 2011 when only 35% of Americans own smartphones. That's made a huge difference in just under a decade. Well, if you mention the talk in black families, they know exactly what you mean. Some say it's a conversation about life and the reality for blacks. Others say it's a conversation about survival and how to deal with systemic racism, especially in dealing with law enforcement. Carolina Impact's B. Thompson has more from those who have to give the talk to those who have to hear and learn from it. The talk is a vital, it is part of a rite of passage. I will say that, and it's not something that you're like, oh, I can't wait, I get to have this talk. It's, I gotta have this talk. Our talk is kind of how to stay alive, how to make it home when dealing with our protectors. It's not fair to have to have that conversation with these conversations that you must have because this has occurred. I've had the talk with both my parents, both my mom and my dad, 
but with my generation, I feel like we're more like, it, we feel like it shouldn't, we shouldn't have to have a talk. For African Americans, it may not be the conversation they want to have with their youth, but they know they must have it. A talk about survival in a society that may not value their lives. The recent deaths of unarmed African Americans have been followed by demonstrations calling for justice and the acknowledgement that black lives matter. Yet the talk didn't just begin, it's been going on in black homes for decades. Uh, I think before when you mentioned the talk, it was about the birds and the bees. And then later on you realized it was another vital component to you growing up as a, as a boy into a man, that if discussion didn't happen, then you may not even get to that point. The talk is about survival, specifically when you deal one-on-one -on -one with law enforcement. The first rule, stay calm. If you're in the car, keep your hands on the wheel. Obey directions while keeping a calm voice and respectful tone, and move slowly. These are the basic tenets of the talk. And while you may feel wrongly accused, it's not the time to argue. The only goal, to leave the encounter unharmed. Knowing that if a situation um, intensified, to be able to know that you're not gonna win that battle there at that particular time, especially when we're dealing with a police officer. While I can do everything I can, I can be respectful as I can be, I can cooperate as much as possible, it's not always going to ensure and guarantee my safety. The way my mom brought it about, it was like, so, so random. I, to me, it was random. But to her, it had to be something that was on her mind, burdening her growing up a young black man. It's part of the reason mentors from the Males Place, North Carolina's leading male mentoring program, provide guidance to these young men who question why they must be schooled uh, on staying alive when others are not. Unfortunately, it's a discussion that we have to have, and then when they begin to integrate and act, interact with uh, maybe their, their white friends or other who are different cultures, different worldviews, and not understand why, you know, they would have certain hesitations, certain reservations, why their worldview changes when you're dealing with certain topics, dealing with police, dealing with government, um, why, you know, why they feel that way. It's very frustrating, because you have to ask yourself, when is enough enough? You know, and uh, when we get to the place where uh, people of authority can understand that, you know, um, deadly force shouldn't be taken. Shoot! Hands up! Don't shoot! It was the interaction with the program participants, helping them to deal with conflict, that prompted their participation in a local protest, learning the skills to change a system. We went to the demonstration with the NAACP and had an opportunity to show them they were in the front lines, marching, then you know we debriefed at the end, say, hey, this is the reason why we're doing it, this is the reason why we were uh, organized here, why it moved to here, why we marched here, and while the message was, was going forth, this is the reason why certain chants were being said. Do you guys understand that? People are, uh, of all ethnicities and cultures are very frustrated at what's going on, and a lot of people are stepping up. These young men do understand and have their own thoughts on how their generation will affect change using their communication stream of choice, social media. We're gonna get the word out, and then we're gonna take action by Going, going before like the mayor, going before people, going before people of power, letting them hear what we have to say. But first, we have, before we can even do that, we have to be united. And instead of me just standing there, and my generation just standing there and being like, well, it is what it is, I guess we'll talk to our children. We're like, no, we're gonna change the whole system. We're not gonna let it be this way anymore. We're not gonna let color be such a big dictator on how people are treated in our country. Yet they are also wise enough to know there's a reason why black parents still have the talk. It will hurt your family more to lose you than it will hurt you to be disrespected by a police officer. Words to live by, and that's the goal of the talk, to live. For Carolina Impact, I'm B. Thompson. Thank you so much, B. We found some PBS resources to help with the talk, and you can find them, of course, on our website at pbscharlotte.org. While art and artists can deliver so much passion to a movement, 
For some, art gives a voice or an image that shows anger, frustration, and outrage. Art can also give us a sense of hope for the future and a universal connection. Carolina Impact's Jason Terzis has more on some local artists and shares how their talents resonate. Charlotte's Noda District, known for many things, but perhaps most of all, art. Paintings, metalwork, cement facades, mosaics, you name it, it's likely here somewhere. Even the local light rail station highlights the area's artsy theme. And right by that stop, Abel Jackson is hard at work. A wall mural he's calling self-love. Passers-by can't help but notice. These are uh, friends of my children, these are my relatives, my people, um, like that's, my, that's gonna be my niece. This is uh, one of my good friend's sons, and this is another of um, my friend's daughters. Up and down the ladder, Abel goes, constantly checking things out. Making sure all those intricate details of the fingers, teeth, and fingernails are done just right. The gist of it is about uh, the appreciation of, of love for your loved ones, your family, and your friends, and then at the same time, taking time out to love yourself. A different artist, a different area of town. The South End neighborhood is where Kyle Mosier is working on his own wall mural. I have to go grab a different ladder. It's all part of a residency Kyle is doing at the 335 apartment community, with a few murals already done and a few more still to go. It's two figures connected through a deep, deeply intimate moment where they will be uh, sort of looking at each other and embracing each other. Kyle and Abel just aren't connected through the local arts community. Charlotte in general is, is very good at nurturing and incubating creatives. I've lived in other cities where these opportunities just don't exist. They're also connected with something much larger. Yeah, I just got a call that Sunday. I got a call or, or text and it was like, would you like to be a part of this project? I asked a couple of questions and I was just like, oh yeah, sure. I'd love to be a part of that. To extend that invite out to me to be a part of that was um, really amazing. Abel and Kyle were just two of the many artists and volunteers taking part in the Black Lives Matter street mural uptown, a project that was conceptualized and completed in just four days. For me, it was first and foremost, it was a way to kind of work out, I guess if you want to say the angst or the frustration, to be able to have a way to express myself in such a time, uh, that was very, very valuable. Given the letter C, Abel created a silhouette of Tommy Smith, the 1968 U.S. Olympic track and field star, who after winning the gold medal in the 200 meter sprint, raised his fist during the medal ceremony as a protest against racism. The move sparked controversy, but remains a symbolic image in the fight against inequality. Well, when we talk about some of the issues that we're confronted with now, which are the same issues that he was confronted with, uh, I think that what he did was an iconic symbol. It was like uh, making a statement when you can't speak, but you can do something visually that is impactful. Kyle did the art for the letter I, but unlike most of the letters, his comes with a hidden message, a code embedded right into it. I wanted people to come together and have dialogue. I wanted people like bringing people together around dialogue. So uh, I encourage, at the time I had encouraged people when we were painting it, to seek out someone that doesn't look like you, come together and try to you know, figure it out. So it was for dialogue. It was, it was meant to be difficult. Kyle says it means a great deal to him to have been a part of the project. I'm really grateful. I mean, that, that's a moment in time, you know, like that I got to be a part of and uh, it means a lot to me. It, it sort of like was a culmination of all of these things that I am passionate about and who I am that all came together for this one moment. And um, it was one of the most surreal things I've ever been a part of. While the turnaround time from idea to completion happened fast, the guys realized the magnitude and lasting impact the mural is having on the community. I thought I was just going to come out there, paint a letter C and, and you know, go home. But uh, it was way larger, way more powerful than what I anticipated. For us to all come together to create was something that I'll never forget. It was really amazing. Can't you understand that the only difference between me and you is the color of our skin? Dion Hunter is using a different form of art to spread her message of education, understanding, and unity. I've always felt like I, I just want to make at least a little difference in the world and she's doing it in the form of spoken word poetry. Why do you believe that we are any different? Dion is a U.S. military veteran and has been writing poetry for about eight years. She's using America's current social climate to get creative. And I really wanted to express my feelings in a way 
that was outside of the norm that could maybe get someone to listen. No stranger to racism herself, Dion vividly remembers the time she was in art class. Short on colored pencils, she asked a white classmate if she could borrow some. His response? Why don't you have your own stuff? Didn't your father get his welfare check yet? And you know, my dad worked every day. My mom died when I was seven. Um, we weren't <laughs> anywhere near rich, but we weren't on uh, government assistance either. Over the last few months, Dion has created three videos, Black Lives Do Matter, I Can't Breathe, and Humanity. She feels that a good amount of racism is taught or learned behavior handed down by each generation and also reinforced by stereotypes depicted in the media. And there was a certain point in my life when the only people you saw of color on TV were, uh, you know, the someone doing something illegal. So if you don't know any black people, then that's who you think all black people are. Through her spoken word poetry videos, Dion says she's doing what she can to help today's racial climate. Because I truly believe that if someone listens with an open mind uh, to explanations about what's going on in society, we'll have more unity. Using art in various forms, just some of what charlatans are doing to help ease today's social tensions. For Carolina Impact, I'm Jason Tursis reporting. Thanks, Jason. 22 artists took part in the Black Lives Matter street mural in Center City at Tryon and 4th Streets. Well, as we wrap up this special report, I'd like to share some words from historic figures. American author James Baldwin said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. And Benjamin Franklin said, justice will never be served until those who are unaffected are as outraged as those who are. Thank you for joining us for this special edition of Carolina Impact Seeking Unity. We appreciate your time, and we look forward to seeing you back here again next time. Good night, my friends. of PBS Charlotte.